I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Agile Evaluation, Fixing the Broken Feedback Loop. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive the email, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. And this presentation will be listed with other recordings, so you would simply just search for this webinar's title. And again, I think the majority of you have registered through the free events website, so if you did, then you will automatically receive an email tomorrow with the recording link. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I'm a program manager here at UCI Extension. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features, so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about UCI Extension's e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our winter quarter, which begins in January. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Julie Dirksen of Usable Learning. At the end of her presentation today, we will have a brief Q&A session if we have time remaining. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to UCI John and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Julie regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel and we can address it at the end if we have time. So if you look at the top of the participant list in the upper right hand corner, and this is if you're on a PC, um, you'll wanna click on the chat bubble icon and the chat panel will appear on your screen. And I believe that if you're on a Mac computer, you'll wanna look in the lower right hand corner um, and you will be able to see the chat icon there. You'll want to make sure that you send any questions to all panelists. And feel free, again, to submit your questions throughout the presentation. And if we have time for Q&A at the end, we'll be addressing them during that time. Um, and also, Julie may be posing some questions to you throughout her presentation. So when you a question is posed and you want to submit your response, you'll want to go ahead and do that, again, in the chat panel and be sure please to send them to all panelists and that way myself and Julie will be able to see your answers. So here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you will get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, um, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design, training managers and coordinators, HR professionals, and individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. If you currently deliver face-to-face instructor-led training, your company may be asking you to switch to e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few classes in the program before they declare, just to make sure that they want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed below. We have principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design practicum. 
Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principles class first and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. And please note that there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must have successfully completed all of the other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. In the upcoming winter 2016 quarter, we are offering Principles of E-Learning Instructional Design, Exploring E-Learning Development Tools, Project Management for E-Learning Professionals, and the E-Learning Instructional Design Practicum. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $615. Enrollment will open this Friday, October 30th, and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our Student Services Office at the number provided. We do encourage students to enroll early as classes fill up quickly. Each course in our program costs $615, so you're looking at a total of $3,690 in course fees for the six online courses. You don't pay the entire total up front. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program, so in the end you're looking at $3,815 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must purchase or otherwise have access to and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool such as Articulate Studio, Storyline, Adobe Captivate, or other. So therefore, software fees may be an additional expense. Here's a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There's a lot of information about our program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. And I'd like to specifically point out, I circled it here in red on the slide, um, information about a special discount that we offer. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego and ATD Orange County chapters. If you're a member of either of these chapters, please visit the chapter website for more information about the 10% discount. Here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which always has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any available courses by clicking on the green online button. Um, if you see a to be scheduled, that indicates when particular courses are scheduled to be offered, but registration just hasn't opened up yet. So again, for winter, you'll notice right now it says to be scheduled. However, when registration opens this coming Friday, October 30th, the to be scheduled will switch to green online buttons that you can click on to enroll. And as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you will want to plan ahead. All right, at this time, I'd like to hand the presenter ball over to our guest presenter, Julie Dirksen, so that she can provide an introduction and also begin her portion of the presentation. So Julie, can Hello. you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Wonderful, you're coming in loud and clear, perfect. Great, fantastic. Um, hi everybody, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I know you just filled out a survey about this, but I would actually really love to know a little bit about you as well. Um, so if you are uh, present, if you can type in the chat window just a little bit about your role and what kind of learning you may be designing evaluation for. I know we're talking about specifically e-learning. Um, I'm wondering, are you doing workplace? Are you doing higher ed? Uh, what's kind of the subject area, that sort of thing. So if everybody can take just a moment and type in the chat window a little and tell me a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Um, that's really helpful because uh, then um, I can find out a little bit more and, uh, and kind of talk to your specific examples as well. Um, so the, while you're doing that, um, uh, I uh, will just explain the title really briefly, Agile Evaluation, Fixing the Broken Feedback Loop. Um, one of the big issues that I've seen kind of over and over again is um, e-learning not 
progressing as fast as some other technologies, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but I think one of the big reasons is um, is this issue of a feedback loop. And uh, so I will go ahead and talk more about that. Um, uh, so obviously you're already answering this in the chat window. I'm seeing um, a couple of course designer for higher ed. I'm seeing supporting faculty. Um, education and business programs. Um, uh, I've got we've got somebody from um, retail, uh, e-learning training, development, corporate training, manager at nonprofit, education. Um, okay, terrific. So I'm seeing a lot of different answers here um, uh, around this, and. I don't know how long you've been involved in e-learning, but I've been doing e-learning for now at the point where I can measure it in decades. My first e-learning project for a workplace thing was, I want to say 1994, and I was using the Future Splash 2 player to do rollovers on, um, uh, to explain a software screen. Um, and I was super excited that I could do web, you know, do that via web-based training, and I did authorware, and I did all sorts of things. So, so I'm, I'm kind of, like I said, I'm, I've tipped over in the 20-year mark in terms of my involvement with e-learning. And um, there's, this issue, right? Because, you know, there's then and now, and how different is it really? Because pretty much all of the other technology that we use is kind of unrecognizably different. I, you know, right before this call, I deposited um, some checks by taking pictures of them with my phone. I mean, that is that, you know, banking in 1994 and banking, or 1995 and banking in 2015 looks completely different than it did then. But e-learning, you know, honestly, not that much. Um, the kinds of courses that we were building and releasing on CD-ROM in 94, 95, 96, um, you know, it's just a little prettier now because we have access to better stock art. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, a lot of it really looks similar to the stuff that was being created 20 years ago. There's pages, there's next buttons, there's text, sometimes there's audio and visual narration, occasionally there's a little bit of interactivity, but it doesn't, it doesn't look drastically different in, in sort of that 20 year time frame. Um, any theories about that? Any theories about why e-learning has been sort of seemingly slower to progress than um, other, other forms of technology? If you've got a theory, type it in the chat window, take a, take a, take a stab at the question. Education hasn't changed in those years either, right? Yeah, and, and in some ways that's logical because education, you know, the, the human brain doesn't evolve in 20 years. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, so you know, why would, why would our methods drastically change? By the way, a number of people are, are chatting to me privately as the presenter, including Daniel's highly entertaining comment blaming it on aliens. So you might want to switch that to all attendees so that everybody can see your chat comments. Um, I have a comment about infrastructure constraints in companies and schools. Many people have been resistant to change in technology. Yeah, I think, I think that those things kind of come into play. Um, adult learning principles have not really changed. Um, uh, yeah, I think that that's probably true too. Um, and, and, but I have kind of another theory. I think there's a few things that are going on. Um, uh, by the way, I will just mention that most of my work is in um, adult kind of workplace environments, corporate training, things like that. Um, but I've definitely worked in the nonprofit sector. I've also definitely worked in the higher ed sector. Higher ed has a few different issues than workplace does, but the, and I, think, I think fundamentally there's some really similar things going on. So if we have this problem, we've already sort of talked about what we think is going on, there's a couple of things. One is sort of the waves of technology. Um, and by this I mean, um, when we were first doing some stuff on CD-ROM, we were doing some kind of cool things. You know, there was some nice multimedia use. Um, authorware could do some cool interactivity, you know, all of these sorts of things. And then the web came along and we had to put everything online and it all kind of got stupid again, um, where it was basically page turners and things like that. And then uh, the online stuff started to get a little bit better. Um, it started to get a little bit more advanced. We started to get Flash, and we could kind of do some cooler things online, and it started to get a little bit more interesting. And then rapid authoring tools like Captivate and um, 
uh, Captivate and Articulate and things like that came along, and it kind of all got stupid again. Um, and now the rapid authoring tools have been getting a little bit better and a little bit more interesting, and you've got a little bit more functionality in those kinds of things. Um, and then Steve Jobs killed Flash, and that sort of dumbed everything back down again because we're now trying to work in HTML5. And mobile learning came along, and now it all has to run on a mobile device, and it sort of all got stupid again. So we, you know, every time we start to kind of do more interesting things with e-learning, a big technology wave comes through and really kind of strips down the principles of what we can do because we tend to rely on tools, um, authoring tools of some kind or another, either the functionality that exists in something like Blackboard or um, Canvas or one of those kinds of tools if you're on the higher ed side or Moodle, um, or we're relying on the authoring ability that's in kind of the rapid authoring tools like Articulate um, and Storyline and things like that. And so now those are starting to get a little bit more interesting. We're starting to get the ability to support variables and conditional actions and things like that in Storyline. And so we're starting to get a little bit more interesting again, but I honestly don't think that, that that's necessarily the whole problem. Um, if you're on the workplace side, this is less of an issue on the higher ed side, but if you're on the workplace side, um, you've been cursed with SCORM, which means that the only thing you can really know about what your learners are doing in their e-learning environment is whether they've completed a course, um, what score they got, and maybe time on task or something like that. And so it's kind of like the little pinhole. You can sort of see a tiny, tiny little pinhole of viewing um, what your users are actually doing. Uh, the nice thing about higher ed is that you actually have a little bit more latitude for that, um, unless you're, again, dealing with primarily self-study materials like in a MOOC or something like that, in which case, you know, you might be getting some data about what your learners are doing, but it's not, you're not getting really great data about what your learners are doing. So we, we really can only sort of shout into the void and, and get a tiny bit of information back about well, how people are interacting in our environments and what kinds of things that they're doing. Um, there's also this notion of the 10,000 hour rule. Now that's a little bit of a myth. It's not, um, uh, it's probably not really 10,000 hours. The answer is it probably depends. Um, but it's this idea that if you do something for 10,000 hours, that's what's required for expert um, performance. But one of the criteria for that is that be developing expertise requires what's called deliberate practice, which is frequent and often expert feedback. Um, so it might be you know, doing an action and seeing what result you get. So if you're hitting a golf ball and you're seeing where it's going, how far it's going, that's, that's a form of feedback. Or the expert standing next to you and telling you that, you, you know, you pulled your hips when you, when you, when you swung the golf club um, and here's how to fix that is expert feedback. So doing something for 10,000 hours doesn't make you an expert or whatever the number really is. Um, uh, but doing something for, you know, quite a while, but getting in, a, in an environment where you're getting really good feedback on either finding out what the results of your actions are or getting somebody to evaluate, that's probably where that real expertise comes in. Um, this is my favorite example of the 10,000 hour rule. This is a guy who decided to quit his job and do nothing but work on his golf game for 10,000 hours to see if he could get on the pro tour. I'm not sure how he's paying for it, but he seems to, he seems to be managing it. He keeps a little time clicker that sort of says. So, but, you know, if he's not getting enough feedback into his system, it isn't going to actually work. He isn't actually going to get to that sort of expert level. So I think we kind of have this problem in most e-learning. Um, how many people here, you can either do the hand raise tool or just type in the chat, how many of you have ever taught some kind of live class, um, you know, some kind of face-to-face -face or instructor-led training. So of the people who are in here, how many of you have taught something, something in person? Okay. So a, a, number, a few people have. Um, some people who have taught something in person, have you ever taught something in person, maybe more than once, taught the same class more than once, and not learn something in the first class that you tweaked in the second class? Has anybody ever had the experience where you didn't, you didn't tweak something the, the second time you taught something around, you know, in a, in a live classroom environment? Alyssa says no, Janet says no. No, right? 
Okay, it, I, I've asked that question in a number of groups in, in tweet classes between cross periods, right? I've asked that question in a number of groups. That, that scenario does not exist where you teach something uh, in a live fashion and you don't learn something about um, what you're doing that you feed into the next time that you teach it. Or the next time you teach anything, quite frankly, you learn what works, what doesn't work. And this is where a lot of expertise comes from in teaching, is that experience, that work that didn't work, here's what I need to do, I need to explain that activity better, that went on way too long, um, you know, this one was confusing for people, any of those kinds of things. The, the challenge with a lot of e-learning, though, is especially self-study materials, tends to get built and just kind of thrown out there to the void, and you're not getting that, that information back the way that you would get it back in a live classroom about whether people are understanding it and whether people are getting the point and whether the activity is really working the way that you wanted to and those kinds of things. So when we shift from a classroom environment to an online environment, and like I said, in particular online self-study, really becomes important to try to find some paths into, into getting feedback on what's happening with your learners. And the issue is it's not just, like I said, it's just not just how many time, much time you spend doing it. It's, it's basically are you, are you actually developing and evolving as you do things? This is um, a quote from Kathy Sierra before she closed on her Twitter account um, that she talks about, do you have five years experience or just one year repeated five times? Um, years of experience is a poor predictor of performance because unless you're really getting good feedback in each of those years, you're not necessarily improving. And so that's what we're really looking at from an e-learning point of view is that I think the feedback mechanisms have been failing us largely. Um, if you were teaching a synchronous or asynchronous class, you're getting some feedback, but you're not getting as much feedback as you would get if you were teaching live because you're not seeing affect, you're not, you know, hearing from your students in the same way, um, you know, those kinds of things. So again, we still have this sort of extra burden of how, or how do we try to get a little bit more information into our system um, so that we know that we're getting better as e-learning facilitators or designers or things like that. <laughs> so how many of you regularly, if, if you're creating e-learning, specifically e-learning, how many of you regularly get to see people use it in some way? Anybody? If you do get to see it, how are you seeing it? Testing? So, sure. So, if you're sort of seeing the results on um, different kinds of tests that you're submitting and things like that, that's helpful. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, student reporting using past lessons and future in class. Yeah, okay. So if you're hearing from your students or you'll be able to have conversations with them, then that, that re definitely represents a form of feedback. And so, you know, I, I don't want to kind of imply that there's no feedback going on, but you know, when I ask this question for groups of people, I sometimes, I don't think I've ever gotten more than about 50% people actually saying, yes, I regularly get to see people use my, you know, use my e-learning. Um, frequently, it's a lot less. Uh, so, then you don't really know if, if what you're doing is effective. You might have big picture things like, okay, they can pass the post-test, but you don't know kind of which elements are probably working the best or not working well, or which ones are people just sort of able to overcome, or is your test good enough to really assess these things, all of those kinds of questions. Um, on the corporate side, the, the standard kind of traditional measure of e-learning um, or, you know, training in general is Kirkpatrick's level. So level one is that um, uh, student evaluation at the end of the course where they fill out the little Likert scale or whatever and say, yes, this was useful or no, it wasn't useful. Um, and uh, level two is a pre-post test or, you know, measurement of learning, which might be a pre-post test. We test them before, we test them after. Hey, there's, there's some increase. Great. They must have learned something. Um, then level three is, beha is behavior. Are they actually doing something different in the real world based on this class? Um, and then level four is sort of results or return on investment. Did the effort and money we put into developing that class kind of pay off in terms of the outcomes that we're getting from it? So here's my issues with these. I, I think that these are all important things and I, I'm not in any way advocating against measuring them, but 
and the way that they really play out in the real world from what I've seen is something along the lines of this. Levels one and two are typically not meaningful. Um, level one evaluation student reactions can sometimes help you understand that there's a problem. Like if everybody hates the class, then yeah, you probably have an issue there. But it doesn't really tell you much about the efficacy of the class. It doesn't really, you know, if everybody loved it, it doesn't actually mean that it was effective. It just means people enjoyed the experience. Um, level two, the testing. Um, I, you know, test, multiple choice testing for um, corporate, uh, anything that's really behavior or skill based I think is, is rough, you know. Um, it's kind of like the driver's test for driver's ed. You, you know, it might tell you that people studied the little book and can, you know, know, um, know some of the basic rules of uh, driving, but it doesn't really tell you that you want to give them the keys to the car and send them out into the world. So, you know, I, I think most of the testing I see is not great, and there's just some real limitations to what you can do in the testing format about whether or not people really have the capability. Um, levels three and four are difficult and costly. So in the ideal world, you're, you know, you do a training on wearing safety glasses, and you count how many people are wearing safety glasses on the shop floor before, and you count how many after the training. And if more people are wearing them after the training, that's your, that's your success measure. Well, that's great when it's a really visible behavior, um, but a lot of our behaviors are not visible enough. Um, you know, if you do a class on teaching managers to give better feedback, you can sometimes find visible measures of that, but if your organization is not already collecting a lot of metrics um, about their employee uh, performance, um, it's really very difficult to make that happen from kind of a learning and development point of view. Uh, <laughs> the fourth measure was ROI, um, and I don't even want to touch ROI, quite frankly. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, uh, so, you know, these ones, which are ones really tell you if something's working, they require access to the full target audience, which you don't always have. Um, it's measuring behaviors, which often requires extensive and costly observation. It's difficult to implement without pre-existing organizational performance metrics, and sometimes it's hard to attribute due to confounding variables. Like, okay, we're selling more widgets, but we also just released a new widget right around the same time that we did the widget training, and so was it because we've got a new product and everybody loves it, or was it because the training somehow had, had an impact? Um, so, I don't, I typically don't see level three happening or happening well. And this is a quote from Twitter, whenever a majority of users tend to misuse a tool, beyond a certain point it becomes the tool's fault. And I, like I said, I don't have any problem with the stuff that Kirkpatrick's measures are talking about, but he's, you know, he and his, his whole, you know, the company and the family have been talking about those measures for, I don't know, 40 years now, something like that, and it's not getting better as far as I'm concerned. Um, what is getting better is some organizations are better at collecting performance metrics, but that's kind of happening outside of the learning and development department. So, so telling people they really need to collect data on actual behaviors, we've been saying it's really important for, for decades, and it doesn't seem to really change as far as I'm concerned. So at a certain point, I think it's, um, you know, we're look, we need to basically look for other um, look for other ways. I, like Alyssa's suggestion, gamify level three and ask learners to report in social media. I think that is a, I think that is a, a a feedback mechanism. I think we'll I think we'll totally hang on to that and add it to the list of you know possible solutions for this. So if we're looking for this uh, overlapping Venn diagram, it needs to be something where we have enough budget and resources to measure it. It needs to be something where we have enough control over the environment that we can actually make it happen. And it needs to be something where we have kind of good methods to evaluate. And quite frankly, a lot of times I, those three circles don't overlap at all in terms of what I see people doing or what I see in organizations. Um, this is, and like I said, I don't really want to get into ROI because I think it's, um, I think when we're dealing with non-financial, sort of ephemeral kinds of things, if we're talking about sales numbers, it's not that hard, but if we're talking about diversity training, for example, how are you ever going to, um, you know, attach this? This is my favorite. This is the Bozarth Ferguson magic formula, how top consultants calculate the value of training. So it's P and E ratio of company stock over number of adjectives in the mission statement plus contact hours per employee times the square root of rainbows. Um, 
that's kind of how I feel about it. We're chasing, you know, I, I'm not going to chase that particular unicorn, but um, but I do want to know something about what if what I'm doing is effective or not effective. And I think one of the problems is we're measuring what we can control. So I see um, reports from training groups that talk about seat time or number of learning objects or number of people trained or completion status or pre-post scores. And this is something where we can measure it in the LMS, which is within our control. But the issue is, is that these aren't really telling us about efficacy. Um, uh, from the inestimable Gloria Gary, uh, she had a thing where she was you know, in a meeting once we we're talking about all this and she says, well, why don't we just weigh them? Then we can say we, you know, we trained 6,000 pounds of users, um, uh, 6,000 pounds of learners, that, that's really meaningful. So um, the other thing that happens is, is the street lamp effect. There's this idea of, um, uh, oh gosh, there's this old saw about this guy who's wandering around under street light and he's obviously intoxicated and the police officer comes up and says, sir, can I help you? And the guy says, I can't find the keys to my car. And the police officer says, did you drop them here? And he said, no, I dropped them over there, but the light's better over here. So um, we're looking where the light's better, which tends to be, again, the things that are within our control. It might be the things that are visible in the LMS. It might be um, some other stuff. One of the things that is usually in our control is the development process. We see all parts of that because that's what we're doing every single day. The implementation, once it gets loaded to the learning management system or once it gets put up on there, um, again, if you're teaching a higher ed class, you're, you're actually interacting with your students, so you're seeing some results from that. Um, but if all too often in kind of corporate e-learning, the course just gets loaded and we just, as like I said, get completion status and, and maybe a post-test score or something like that, which means that all the light shining on the development process, and so when we look at what's advanced in the technology, in especially on the corporate side of e-learning in the last 20 years, it's tended to really be about making the development process faster, not making the whole thing more effective. And I think it's because we can see that part of the process. That's the part where we're, um, uh, that's the part where we are able to, you know, we're able to see how long did it take us to do content reviews or how long did it take us to publish out, you know, this particular course. And so all of the real advancement in the field has been about making um, rapid authoring tools more available to people or making, you know, what used to take, um, you know, two weeks in hand-coded HTML can do and be done in a few hours by using a tool that publishes out your PowerPoint slides or something like that. Well, you know, that's that's been our main offering of advancement. If we can't establish that what we're doing is better and more effective than what we were doing last year, at least we can establish that we're doing it faster and more cheaply. Um, but that's a, you know, that's a, that's a whole with a really, like, um, uh, you know, we're going to hit the end of that that tunnel really quickly because, you know, we can only squeeze so much time out of the process. Um, and, you know, design is complicated. Um, we think it's a straight path, but really it's much more zigzaggy and you can't always um, anticipate. So even the most expert instructional designer is kind of guessing at a certain point that this is going to be an effective learning activity. And the real answer is the best learning is the learning that works. And the only way that you know it works is if you're kind of getting some kind of feedback on what's effective, what's not effective. Um, so what can we do about this? What's in this intersection of visible, feasible, and desirable? And like I said, Alyssa, I had this great idea of um, gamifying level three and asking learners to report in social media. That's something that's visible, it's feasible, it's desirable. So that is something where we would get um, a really nice kind of little piece of feedback. And I want to make a big distinction between feedback and proof. Um, I am not I am advocating something that just gives us some information coming back into the system because we really don't have enough right now. So anything that brings more data back into the system and being generally is a good thing. And you can get false positives and you can get, you know, things like that, but, but no information is not good. <laughs> we know that. Um, so I'm looking for a quicker, less expensive method to ensure feedback loop that can be used to assess and improve. Um, so at a certain point, I'm not really talking about, um, you know, evaluation for the learners. I'm really talking about it. This is evaluation for us as designers. 
how do we know if what we're doing is working? Um, it's not intended to be a full measure of efficacy. I think you, you know, you still may need to wrestle with that and you still may need to wrestle with it in, in terms of a level two or level three or either those kinds of things. Um, but what I'm really talking about are sort of looking at some qualitative measures of retention of information, attitude. It can be anecdotal or observable behavior change, maybe from a small sample size, and I'll talk more about kind of all of these. Um, one of the big transformations that happened in software development was about 10 years ago, well, a little over 10 years ago, 1994, Jacob Nielsen wrote a really influential article called Gorilla HCI. Um, and one of the problems was they knew, um, the usability people knew that, that software development would be much, much better if they did user testing with the software development. But the problem was we're getting a lot of pushback from the industry saying, you know, we can't do statistically significant samples. It's too costly to, to test dozens of people on the software. And so what Jacob Nielsen did is he tested, um, uh, oh gosh, I guess he tested about 15 users altogether um, uh, on a variety of different software tasks. And he found out that what really happened after, um, is that after five to six users, they had found somewhere between 80 and 100, you know, 80 and 90 percent of all of the issues um, uh, just doing kind of uh, what he referred to as discount usability testing, which is kind of a low rent, rough and dirty, you know, form of user testing. Um, and that that testing more users beyond that point, um, doing more elaborate testing beyond that point was not buying. You know, you might squeeze another 10 or 20 percent of the issues out of the piece of software, but it wasn't any of the big stuff anyway. And so that, um, so he basically created for the software testing industry this heuristic that five to six users, assuming that you're, um, you don't have really wide degrees of variability in your target audience. Um, you know, if your target audience is, doctors and nurses and, um, you know, parking attendants at the hospital, then you may need to have a sample from doctors and a sample from parking attendants and, you know, things like that. But you don't need dozens of users to, to get really useful data that can be fed back into the system. And so I think we need to kind of take a similar attitude towards um, learning design. And, really get to this point where we're asking ourselves about individual little pieces, is this working? Um, this is a friend of mine who does user experience design, and he talks about how it's not about right versus wrong, it's about better versus worse. Ask yourself, is this better instead of is this right? Um, and so what the focus there is we tend to want to come up with a quote unquote right solution for learning, and sometimes reputations get staked on this. We just built a huge, you know, um, six month training program for car salespeople, and now, quite frankly, there are a lot of, there's a lot of money and there's a lot of reputation on the line, and I have had clients actually tell me that they can't afford to do level three evaluation because they're genuinely afraid it's not going to work and politically that would be really bad within the organization. And so one of the things about bigging, building large things and then trying to test it all at once is that you've gone pretty far out on the limb. And if you find out that it doesn't work, you are, you got problems there. Um, uh, we talked about the fact, Carl and I have had this conversation about how when somebody says, well, you're the expert, that that's not flattery, that's basically like setting you up for blame, <laughs> essentially. That, that expertise can only do so much and that you really need, again, that feedback loop in there. And you need to do it um, focusing on, you know, assuming that we don't know if this is going to work, but we're going to try it and see. Um, and if it does work, great, we'll do more. If it doesn't work, we'll do something different, which is what sort of we describe as this right versus better focus. Um, it's a little bit like traditional project management versus agile project management. Traditional project management has this myth that you can somehow plan out a whole project from start to finish right up front. Um, and that you can do the bulk of this planning and that you'll just need to just slightly as you go, um, which, you know, if you've ever been involved in software development, you know that that is silly. That is not how that works at all. Um, versus agile project management, which assumes we're, there are too many variables, it's too complex an environment, we can, we're going to, you know, we're going to focus on, on a particular thing and sprint towards it for two weeks and then we'll sort of see where we are and figure out what we need to do next. Um, and uh, Clay Shirky's got this great quote, which is really about this sort of big 
upfront planning waterfall method amounts to a pledge by all parties not to learn anything while doing the actual work. Um, so if we build a big, massive course without any feedback into the course while it's being developed and then we send it out into the world, you know, we're sort of pledging that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to figure out what works and what doesn't work and fix it. We're just going to have to run with it because the work's been done and we don't, we've got, we're out of budget, we're out of money, we're out of time. It's got to, it's got to go the way that it is. So how many people are doing usability testing where you're actually sitting somebody down in front of the learning and watching them use, watching them use your program, your e-learning program in some way? Okay, Daniel's doing it. Yay. That's happy. Okay. So if you're not doing user testing of some kind, um, this is probably the first and easiest path into trying to get better feedback into your system. Um, standard usability testing um, comes out of the user experience community, UX, um, and it really just involves sort of sitting somebody down and saying, hey, you know, try to use this and I'm going to watch you do it. Um, it is, um, uh, I don't know if I've got the slide on here, but I'll put it in here. If you're not doing this, the first place to go is um, to get a copy of Don't Make Me Think um, by Steve Krug uh, and his other book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy, is also um, a good book on how to do user testing. Uh, essentially, this doesn't have to be very complicated at all. Essentially, this is, uh, the nice thing is with WebExes, like the one we're on right now, what we can do is, um, and I've done this in seminars, I could have one of, I could give one of you right now a link to the learning, um, have them share their screen, give them presenter rights, have them share their screen, and say, just try to go through this course and you know, sort of tell me what, what makes sense to you and what doesn't make sense to you as you go through it. Um, we don't have time today to get into the steps for user testing, but, you know, Don't Make Me Think has a really good description of it, and in his second book, The Rocket Surgery Make e Made Easy, also has a really good description of that. Um, Usability.gov uh, is also a really nice set of free resources about doing user testing. So I can't recommend that highly enough. I have never done it and not learned all sorts of things. It's kind of painful to watch people um, in something you've built and have it not make sense, <laughs> but it's really, really valuable. Um, another method that I'm really kind of espousing at the moment is um, Brinkerhoff success case. Um, and I'll type that uh, into the chat as well. Um, his book, The Success Case Model, um, or his book on telling training story is really, it's not a very complicated method ultimately. What it involves is a really quick survey of the audience to determine kind of who's, who's successful and who wasn't, who's using it and who's really not using it. Um, and then doing some qualitative in-depth interviews with a, success, a, a, a selection of the successful um, users and the not successful learners. And the idea is, again, it's not proof. It doesn't constitute this sort of, you know, we've tested everybody and we can clearly state that they have attained all the learning objectives, but it's a really nice feedback model for just getting some information again back into the system. And even if all you can do is tell some qualitative stories about what's working and what's not working, that's frequently more than we can do right now. Um, for structured interview format, I've done this as well, where um, I'll just do an interview with, again, five or six users, sometimes four to six weeks after the, the, training inter the training class or the training intervention, and I will have a few questions related to just their impressions and feedback. You know, tell me what you, what you remember from the course. Um, uh, what were the most memorable elements to sort of see what was sticky from that point of view? Um, I might ask them a few con questions about the content just to sort of see, you know, what can they, what can they tell me back about it at this point? Um, and then anecdotal usage of the material. How many, how have they applied ideas from the training or how are they using it and if they are, you know, that kind of thing. So, so again, not proof, not, you know, I, they conclusively know this, but really useful information that sort of helps me know kind of um, what's working and what's not working. Uh, and, you know, you can do surveys, and I've certainly done those and gotten some useful information from them, but surveys have a lot of problems. One problem is people kind of, you know, if they liked you, they like to put nice things down on surveys. They like to say that you were great. 
Um, uh, but unfortunately, liking the instructor and um, liking, uh, you know, and actually getting, getting something effective out of the class are not necessarily the same things. Um, the other problem with follow-up surveys is, you know, people don't always remember, um, and if you can't probe or ask for sort of additional information about um, what's going on, then, uh, you know, you don't always get a really good picture of, um, uh, a good picture of what really what really worked and what really didn't work. Um, cohort analysis is another format. I don't use this one quite as often, but um, but I've seen it used in a few places as well. Which is, I have an audience of twelve thousand nurses that took uh, an e-learning course on um, how to use IV infusion devices, and I it's not practical for me to get results back from all twelve thousand nurses, but I could I follow. Can I do the sort of all full-blown level three, level four analysis on, uh, well, really more level three analysis, but level three analysis on um, a specific cohort? Can I, you know, follow 20 people around, um, you know, chosen, uh, chosen as randomly as possible um, uh, from the, you know, the audience pool and do, do, you know, do really detailed analysis there. Again, not proof, but it tells me, it gives me really good feedback into the system about what, what's working and what's not working. Um, signaling, I, there's this idea in sort of evolutionary biology or whatever that, you know, animals signal different things, um, you know, ready to mate or aggression or, you know, um, uh, a, you know, ability to um, move quickly or, you know, any of these kinds of things will signal this stuff. And humans do that too. So if you're hiring, you know, new college graduates, you don't have any actual experience to make base your hiring decision on because they haven't done anything yet, but you look for signals. If they've got a professional resume, if they're polite in the interview, if they're well-dressed, if they, um, you know, seem like they prepared for the interview, those are all signals that this, you know, person is going to be more professional than um, the person who, you know, doesn't do any of those four things. And so the magic question is kind of, um, it's a concept from psychology, but it's this idea, if we woke up tomorrow and everything about what I had just done in this training class worked really, really well, what would be the first visual signal that tells me that that's true? So is the signal that, um, uh, you know, the software training was effective because now um, the customer service department is getting less calls um, uh, asking how do I install my software or how do I upgrade my software or things like that. So that could be a signal. So looking for those kinds of things in the environment. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, as Alyssa talked about, you know, asking learners to report in social media, um, Jane Bozarth's book, Show Your Work, um, is a great, uh, uh, I'll put that in the chat, um, uh, is a great example of this idea of working out loud. So again, taking, encouraging people to make their work process visible to you so that you can see, um, hey, there's really great stuff going on over here, there's not so much stuff going on over here, that kind of thing. Um, social media, either uh, publicly or internally in an organization can be a way of, you know, getting some data. Um, lots of people talked about that course and are referencing it after the fact when we send out little prompts. Um, almost nobody, you know, is talking about this one, and uh, when we send out prompts, they kind of have nothing to say about it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> We're also trying to figure out how do we look for data. Um, uh, how many people are familiar with XAPI? Uh, it's, it was Tin Cannon data, uh, and now it's XAPI. Right. Um, so XAPI is being added to SCORM as a standard, and it's also being talked about. Um, higher Ed may wind up with a different, has different standards going on, and I'm less familiar with those, I'll admit it. Um, uh, XAPI is, is the focus is a little bit more workplace, although there's no reason it can't be used um, in higher environments, which is the ability to tag um, different events in your learning environment with data that goes back to an LRS or a learner record store. Um, and 
So as those become more available, we'll be able to use that as a tool to hopefully get data again out. Um, so for example, if I have a set of resources along the side of my course materials, I could XAPI tag um, those links and uh, or I could use Google Analytics, which is another method for doing this. Um, and then no, you know, lots of people click this link, nobody ever clicked this link. Um, I know somebody who uses Google Analytics on all her help pages. So she knows a ton of people are on this help page all the time. Um, nobody has ever been to this help page in like the 18 months that the help pages have been up, you know, that kind of thing. Which again, isn't conclusive data, but it does help you sort of understand what your, um, uh, help you understand a bit more about what your users are doing and how things are working and what's going on in your environment. Um, I was talking to some guys at the DevLearn conference uh, um, from Saltbox, which is a company that has um, uh, an LRS product, which is, I said, as I mentioned, Learner Record Store, which is what is usually used to capture X API data. Um, uh, and he was telling me they've got a little product that, where they can do a heat map that just shows how everybody moved through course material and gives you a visual map that sort of shows lots of people went here first and then they did this and nobody's ever been over here and, you know, basically just tells you kind of how people are interacting with your materials, which, again, not conclusive proof, but really potentially useful information in terms of um, just understanding what behaviors people are doing and to kind of open up that pinhole and actually see a bit more about what's going on. Um, we totally don't have time today to get it into too, too much more about XAPI, but if that's something that's interesting to you, I strongly encourage you to look into it. Some of the rapid authoring tools are supporting canned XAPI statements, and it would be really swell if everybody told the nice articulate people that Storyline should be able to write custom XAPI statements because then we could start to get a lot more data going on in terms of what our, um, uh, what our users are doing. Um, some LMSs support XAPI, some don't. It's, it's a new, really new standard, and so we're still kind of working out the details of that. And uh, what do you think? Um, what other methods have you seen? What else uh, have you seen that you think is effective as a way to get, kind of crack open the door and get a little bit of light in the room? Um, what are you using right now? Uh, and, and, you know, this is also time. We've got about four minutes left. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about this if that's helpful. So go ahead and type in the chat window what stuff you've seen that you think is effective or any questions you might have. All right. So not a whole lot there. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I've got a question from Rachel. I work for a nonprofit and we have limited funds and staff to do evaluations. Any ideas, tips? Yeah, um, Rachel, I would really strongly encourage to do some of the follow-up calls if you can manage to do it. I mean, calling up a half a dozen people is something that most of us could probably do in a day or day and a half. Um, so the user testing and uh, the follow-up evaluations, I think, are um, the best bang for the amount of effort involved in those. Um, so if you can add one or two days to project development and, and do some user testing up front and do some follow-up interviews on the back end, I think that's the best, the best use of uh, the use of time and resources. Um, Going back to the first question, how do you think the lag in instructional design enhancement is tied to a disconnect between subject matter experts, t-shirts, and those of the skills to do instructional design in an online course? Yeah, that's a big issue. Um, uh, I think I have, um, yeah, there's, there's my book, which I'm not, and the point isn't to, to, to really promote my book, but, but one of the things that I was sort of seeing in the industry was a lack of resources because so many people come to this via subject matter expertise where they know a lot about their subject area and very little about how to actually teach it or translate it. And so when I, when I wrote Design for How People Learn, it was very much with the intention of kind of providing people some of the foundations of how learning works so that they could um, kind of have be less unbalanced in terms of that skill set. It's intended as very much of an introduction and not a comprehensive method for it, but trying to get people, you know, some tools around that piece of it. Um, it this is kind of the perennial problem, so uh, I think um, 
Oh gosh. Um, I think setting expectations is a really big piece of it. Um, for subject matter experts, um, Brian Chapman at Chapman Alliance has a nice tool on how long it really takes to develop e-learning. And he's talking about, um, uh, uh, he talks about kind of corporate e-learning more. Um, that's where his data comes from, but it's not, uh, it is not a, um, uh, it's not a, um, uh, you know, it always takes longer than people think it is, and so it's helpful to show data around that. Um, some other things, crowdsourcing data in a digital cohort group, yes, using a discussion thread, absolutely. Um, a pop-up event on campus asking, asking faculty staff and staff to do some fun online quiz games, collect data on what they can do. Also, a physical game and more subjective information read their preferences, I think that's great. Um, uh, okay. And um, then a uh, comment about resources. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to give you a link to, um, it's got more than just evaluation resources on it, but it's got a, quite a few of these resources on it. Um, I'm going to give you a quick link to um, my blog resource page where I collect kind of my reading list, which has a lot of the links that I've already mentioned to you. So I will just grab that as well. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, for all of the information that you've shared with us today. And if any of you have any follow-up questions, if you um, want additional resources, feel free. Julie's been kind enough to leave her email address on this um, slide. You can also email me if you have any questions, and I can forward them on to Julie about any, any questions about or comments about the content um, presented today, or if you, again, want any uh, resources to help you in your um, you know, specific situation. So, Julie, if you, or you, you can respond um, via the chat panel, and then, again, if anybody wants to reach out to us after the webinar is over, please feel free to do so. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Julie. Um, hopefully, all of you that have logged in gained some insight into Agile evaluation. Again, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can be reached via email. My email address is on this slide. Um, Julie's email address was on the slide prior to this. And again, you will be automatically receiving a link to this webinar recording. So I know a lot of great resources were shared during the presentation. So if you ever want to go back and rewatch the webinar, again, that link will be automatically emailed to you um, tomorrow. If you have any questions about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, please feel free to direct those questions to me. Um, but feel free, again, to send any questions about the webinar, and I can forward them on to Julie. Thanks so much, Julie, and have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us.